Steve Chee, who is a senior research scientist at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in the California Institute of Technology, where he leads efforts in autonomous systems for space exploration. He has received numerous awards for his research in space autonomous systems, and is currently leading AI scheduling for the EcoStress and OCO3 missions, and is contributing to onboard and ground scheduling for the M2020 rover mission. Today, he will tell us about the growing role for artificial intelligence for space exploration and the search for life beyond Earth. So, welcome again, Steve. So, this talk is uh, going to be distinctly in three parts. So, in the first part, I'm going to tell you some kind of like fun deep whiz stuff about how AI is being used in the space enterprise. Uh, the second part, which is probably more focused on Satish and his group. I'm going to describe three combinatorial optimization problems that we're very interested in solving and, you know, we've been working on probably for over a decade and we still haven't solved them. Uh, and then in the end, I'm going to uh, go to the fun part again and talk about why, you know, I still beat my head against, you know, being at NASA and at JPL, which is basically how AI is really critical to answering the fundamental question of, you know, are we alone? How we can find life outside of the Earth? So, Really, AI at JPL and NASA had this huge explosion when, in 2003, we were given permission to upload software to control this one spacecraft, all Earth Observing One. Now, it's just a random spacecraft. It's not any that unusual. But, you know, since this is space, it has these weird things like it's flying seven and a half kilometers a second. You can see all these objects that are, you know, maybe tens of meters long. And it had a particular hyperspectral sensor that we'll talk a little bit about later. So what, what's the purpose of AI on this? Well, the purpose of AI on this is the normal mode is you decide days, weeks in advance, what it's going to observe. You take the images, and then you maybe look at them a week later. And that's not very efficient. So instead, we want the spacecraft, I always say, not to be smart, but to not be stupid. Okay? And what's stupid? Stupid is taking all these cloudy images and processing them and downlinking them. Stupid is taking an image of an erupting volcano and not even realizing it's an erupting volcano. So we gave the spacecraft the ability to detect large-scale events, like an erupting volcano. This is showing you processing some imagery of the Mount Etna volcano in Sicily. You can actually, the scientists will set a baseline, and if the thermal emission, you know, the amount of energy being emitted in the thermal spectra is above some threshold, we can do all kinds of things. We can say, on the next time over, observe it. Send an alert down. We can send an alert down that's literally more like a text message instead of the three gigabytes of data, which is the single image. Okay, so that means we can get it down faster. And so we did this actually for over a dozen years. We had a lot of impact, you know, because we automate the operations. We can, you know, uh, save money. Uh, we, we can actually respond more quickly. All kinds of wonderful things like that. And then we thought, well, what's better than one spacecraft? Well, actually, there's another way of describing this. We, we got this spacecraft easy enough to operate that people could task it from their smartphones anywhere in the world connected by the internet. And so then we thought, well, what's better than making it so that anybody with a smart, any human can task this? What's dumber than humans? Well, AI, of course, right? We all know AI is dumber than humans. So we said the ultimate test is having software agents all around the world tasking the spacecraft. So that's what we did. This is one of our primary use cases for this, and we call this the sensor web. So we take different spacecraft, we process their data on the fly, and we use them to automatically task other spacecraft. So this is actually showing, you know, uh, fire. There's a system called Rapid Fire developed at the University of Maryland by Rob Solberg. It tracks fires all around the world. We trigger off of them, and then we image them with higher resolution spacecraft, in this case, uh, Earth Observing One. So we can detect something at, let's say, 250 meters or one kilometer per pixel, and then zoom in and image it, you know, with, you know, 30 meters or even one meter per pixel. So we did this uh, for tracking volcanoes all around the world. And we didn't just link in other spacecraft. We linked in, you know, several other spacecraft, but we also linked in all these volcano observatories all around the world. So there's 20 or 30 of them. They have seismic sensors. They have gas sensors. Uh, and they, we aggregate this data and we use it to provide a more global picture of is this volcano erupting? And then if so, then we'll task assets in order to, um, in order to uh, uh, observe it. And this was so effective that over a decade, we, over, with over 100,000 triggers, we triggered thousands of scenes, 
And over 35% of these scenes were what we would call a successful trigger, meaning that they detected an active thermal emission. So we successfully imaged the volcano while it was erupting. So in comparison, if you take an instrument like MODIS that's always on, 0.03% of its scenes over volcanoes are actually thermally active. So this is a much more efficient way to use uh, you know, AI technology to automate all this. And this is one of the reasons why uh, we were asked to support DARPA's Blackjack program. So this is a program where they want to fly 120 spacecraft, proliferate in what's called low Earth orbit, and have them all coordinating to observe things, track things, things like that. We also deployed this for flooding. And the flooding side is very interesting because it even involves modeling. So what you do here is you detect the flooding. This is actually uh, quite old data. Uh, and sorry, I realize I'm supposed to use this so it's in the recording. This is testing my technical skills here. So as we see over here, these are uh, broad scale images. This is Southeast Asia. Uh, and on the left is the, the dry map. And on the right is the flooded map. So these large dark areas in the middle are like the Chow Phraya River, which flows through Bangkok. And it's you know flooding all this area, or the Mekong Delta uh, in the lower right. And so we, again, we use that to trigger the observations of where we're most interested, where the flooding is happening. Uh, and the interesting thing here is that we can also link in uh, hydrological models here. We had a collaboration with the Hydro, the Hydro Agro Institute of uh, uh, Hydro, Hydro Agro Informatics Institute of Thailand. They actually run several different flood models. And these are basically water propagation models. It rains in the mountains, the water flows downhill, eventually the lowland floods anywhere from 14 to 21 days later. So we can use that to predict where the flooding is going to happen. And then we call in all of this uh, commercial imagery. So in this case, GOI or Iconos. These are very narrow footprints, but like one meter per pixel images. And the end product that we deliver to the users is they have what's called a GIS, a geographic information system, where they can click on any pixel and look at the time series of how much water was there. We can infer how deep the water is because we have a digital elevation map. And we know, you know, if the water is here and the water is here, you know, it must be deeper here because, you know, the digital elevation is lower. And so the NGOs can use that to, as a proxy for damage to crops. Um, this was the huge flooding incidents here. Uh, the way in which pe some people in the United States might have learned about this is the price of uh, hard drives skyrocketed because about one third of the world's capacity for building hard drives at that point in time was actually in a factory about 20 kilometers from Bangkok that was flooded and they had to be evacuated. You know, huge amounts of damage. So what's all the different AI? Well, we're all the different places we're using AI. Well, uh, we actually, as long ago as, you know, over a decade, we were using support vector machine learning to learn to classify all different kinds of satellite imagery. Uh, this is to classify snow, water, ice, and land. Uh, you'll see trickle through here. There are all these references. If people are interested in follow-ups, this is like the journal articles on this. We were actually able to outperform the human expert classifiers here. Uh, uh, this is a... a a Bayesian cloud test holding technique that's now been baseline for two or three future missions. Uh, you can just look at here in these two different spectra. So um, our eyes, we see you know, the world in the visual spectra in red, green, and blue. It turns out you know, there's all these different spectra ranging from thermal infrared to you know, x-rays and everything. Uh, we can build these great instruments that can look at different spectra that we can't see. Uh, the problem is, how do you actually analyze this data? So we have what are called hyperspectral instruments that might have 100 to 400 of these spectral bands. Uh, and so now we have this 100-dimensional space, and we need to build these classifiers. Turns out, slightly better than people are machines for this, and we can even choose if we want to make the classifier aggressive or not aggressive. This is a particular application that's rife everywhere, because we two-thirds of the images that we take are cloudy. And generally speaking, people don't want images of the clouds. My apologies to all the atmospheric scientists who want the images of the clouds. Uh, and so in this application, we compress the heck out of the cloudy parts of the images. So that's a huge win because we're producing too much data. Uh, this is actually yet another cloud classifier. This one is using a, a system called TextureCam. TextureCam is an implementation of random decision force classification. So, you know, people are probably familiar with decision trees, random decision forests. They're basically, you take all these little snippets of the trees and then you compete them and they get the vote. It's a random decision forest. Has a lot of nice mathematical properties. There's actually an FPGA implementation of random decision force classifiers. Uh, 
uh, which we like because FPGAs are a very cheap, low power form of computing for space applications. And we hope to fly this in future Mars rovers, in particular called texture cam because computing the texture of the different rocks, which is very important to determine what kind of rocks you're looking at, uh, is usually computationally very expensive, but in the FPGAs you can do it very efficiently. So we're going to hear more about this later. And then finally, the ultimate in onboard processing is actually what's called super pixel or end, end member unmixing. So I said before that, you know, we can make these instruments that see, you know, hundreds or several hundred spectra simultaneously. And what that looks like is all these squiggly lines. These are the different spectra, uh, except you have all these squiggly lines for each pixel. So imagine, you know, you're looking at 10 to the 6 pixels in a single image. In each pixel, there's this other dimension of the spectra where you have 400 dimensions there. And now what you're interested in is, what am I seeing on the ground? So these are actually surface minerals. You can do this for gases as well. One of the biggest applications of this is called imaging spectroscopy, is to look at uh, uh, fugitive emissions like methane, carbon dioxide, and things like that. And it turns out that these substances roughly linearly mix. What does that mean? If I'm looking at a pixel, in this case, the pixel is 30 meters by 30 meters, and it's 50% X and 20% Y, the spectra that I'm going to see to a first approximation is the weighted sum of the substances there, right? So obviously you can invert that. If you have priors on what you think you're going to see, you can use that. And this is actually showing that we can literally do this on board. So now what we can do is we can search for specific minerals, specific gases, and then respond to that. So that's the kind of smarts that we want to put on board the spacecraft. Um, we can also combine all kinds of different information. This is commercial imagery here of the Ayacucho volcano. This is the raw imagery. This is a very poorly, uh, uh, let's just say, stretched image in order to correct for, you know, some of the images are just unusually dark or unusually bright. And then this is showing actually, again, a random decision forest classifier using Pixel Alert that's showing the heat map here. The white zone is saying, we think this is plume. And by the way, it's also falsely saying that that's plume. We think this is the shadow. And we think all of this around here is the land. And then what can we do with that information? Well, if we have that on board, we know the viewing geometry. We know where the sun is. We might know where the ground is. We can actually compute an estimate on what the plume height is. So now we're getting into very interesting stuff to the scientists. So we, again, we want to take all of this data, turn it into knowledge, and then do decision making on it on the spacecraft. Okay, so that's just an example of one of the, you know, literally hundreds of applications where we're trying to, in basically, with no work for the scientists in near real time, go from the data to the knowledge and then put the decision making after that. I'm just going to uh, touch on. Everybody endlessly talks about deep learning now and, you know, supervised learning. We're actually much more interested in some sense in unsupervised learning. What do I mean by that? These are all different kinds of outlier analysis to pull out the things that don't fit in with the rest of the images or even the image set. So this is actually uh, doing a visual outlier analysis that's pulling out the snow at the summit, snow and minerals at a volcano in Chile. Uh, this is one that uh, other people are very interested in. We run it on visual salience, you know, on the visual RGB, and in this rural scene, it's pulling out the buildings because they don't fit in, because they spectrally don't look like the other things. We're running this on visual features, but there's no reason to run this just on visual features. I'm running it on visual features because then it'll also pop to your eyes, but you can run on texture, you can run on spectra the human eye can't see. Uh, fundamentally, you're just pulling things that don't fit in statistically with the rest of the image or even your image set. And so we want this because NASA's job is to go to these planets where we get surprised by things. And when we build these classifiers, the scientists always say, well, what about the things we weren't expecting? So this is our hedge. Go ahead. I mean, what's NASA's interest in buildings? I, it's not like you expect to see buildings in Mars. Yes, but. If you did see them, wouldn't you want to know? <laughs> so Bill Christensen, who's a very famous planetary geologist, once said, we were saying, well, what really? So he's the PI of a bunch of instruments. One of them is a thermal imager in Mars on Mars Odyssey called Themis. Um, 
And he said something that you know seems kind of obvious in retrospect, but he said, the science value of a discovery is exactly proportional to the amount of surprise it generates. So one of the things that we pitched to him, and actually were approved, but then later denied after we approved, was to look for thermal anomalies in all of the, the, the FEMIS data. So when you have an infrared imager, it's basically always on. You never turn it off because you want this instrument. It's, the instrument is trying to detect very subtle thermal signatures, so it has to be a thermal equilibrium. And so when you have one of these instruments, you never turn it off. And so that means that right now we have all these thermal imagers all around the Earth and other planets, and they're collecting all this data, and we're not even reading it out. So our point was, let's go through that and look for different thermal anomalies. And we figured out what's called the NE delta T. That's how big the thermal anomaly has to be for us to detect it to set this threshold. And it would literally have to be red hot lava on the surface of Mars. So just background, lava is roughly 1,000 degrees Kelvin. And it would have to be you know, like a few meters by a few meters of that in order for this to trigger one of our alerts. So nobody expects to see that, but wouldn't you like to look? Yeah. Wouldn't you like to be able to say, at least we know we didn't see that, rather than saying, uh, well, I could have seen it data because we couldn't get it down, right? Okay. So what I'm particularly interested in is scheduling, which is once you make these detections, what do you do with them? So this is a horrible eye chart, but since we're all AI people, I can very easily tell you what we're doing here. Basically, these are all the activities that we actually want to do. And down here, all the things that get in the way. What do I mean by that? These are all the aspects of the spacecraft that we have to check before we can, you know, before some random person in Thailand says, well, image this, you know, forest because maybe it's on fire. We have to know, is the spacecraft even in the field of view? You know, only when you're flying over that area could you, like, take it. We have to know, is there data volume capacity on board in the solid state recorder. We have to know how do we get the instrument in the right mode that takes time, depends on what you're doing last, the last thing you're doing before that. Uh, we have to know is the instrument overheating? We have to track the thermal state of the instrument. Uh, we have to figure out how to get the data down. So when we're in the field of view of the different ground stations, then what, what kind of ground stations are there? Uh, we have S-band and X-band, you know, the low data rate and high data rate downlink. When we're doing the high data rate downlink, we can't actually take images at the same time. So, you know, that's conflicting. So, this is a classic AI search problem. You're searching to optimize some objective function of all of these, you know, activities that you're trying to do. And this is the thing that's always getting in the way. So, it's some form of generated test and a lot of search. So, specifically for this particular problem, for Earth Observing 1, we have what are called priority and maneuver constraints. Can we see the target? Uh, is it overlapping within some temporal zone with another higher priority target? And then we basically search in that space. We actually generate what are called the candidate tuples. We have to consider multiple options, either keeping the instrument on or turning it off in between the observations. And there's a very different sequence. Uh, if the observations are very close, but not overlapping, we can leave the instrument on. If the observations are far apart, we turn the instrument off. There's actually a death zone in between that we actually can't observe. It's very counterintuitive. It's too long to keep the instrument on, but not long enough so that you can turn it off and turn it back on. And then we actually have to do this repair where we track all of those other side features, the thermal, the, you know, the, the instrument mode, and this is where we actually enforce the timing, resource, and state transition, and temperature constraints, and then we repair this. So this is actually the core of this specific search algorithm, and this is actually not atypical of what my group produces, where we have basic AI techniques, and we assemble a domain-specific scheduler for a particular mission, unfortunately on very short notice. Like last May, three different missions came into our, my office in a one-month period and said, hey, we heard you can help us with this. It's like, really? And when do you need this? And one of them was like, well, we launch in eight weeks. So it's a little crazy. Uh, so EO-1, actually, we flew controlling EO-1 for over a dozen years. Then we ran out of fuel. And so 
year one is no more. So we're very sad, but we're actually doing what I would consider even more exciting stuff at Mars. So uh, there is a system that was on board, that is on board Opportunity. Of course, the Opportunity rover is now, is now gone. But it's on the Mars Science Laboratory rover, the Curiosity rover, which is the primary rover that we have at Mars. And it's a system called Aegis does autonomous targeting with a particular instrument called ChemCam. Uh, so ChemCam is what's called a laser-induced breakdown spectrometer. So all of you have probably seen images of Mars. They're all reddish. You guys know why they're all reddish? Yeah, exactly. This is coating the high iron-rich dust. It's covering everything. So if we ran around with our spectrometer and measured all these rocks, we get iron, 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 iron. And then the people who pay, which is you know everybody in this room, the taxpayers who pay $2.4 billion to send this rover to Mars would not be very happy. So what a laser-induced breakdown spectrometer is, is it fires this pulse laser, it burns off the surface, and we study the spectra, again, common theme of spectra, of what comes out and what's underneath, okay? The problem is you don't really want to shoot dirt because the dirt is all the same, and it's all very boring. You want to shoot specific targets. And the old way that they used to do this, oops, I don't have this. So the old way they used to do this is they take a panoramic image at the end of the day, they downlink it, the scientists would sit around, they'd argue, they'd choose targets, uh, and then they would uh, figure out the command sequence to target that rock, and then they'd upload that, and then at the start of the next day, then they would, you know, execute that target sequence, okay? So what Aegis does, is it basically automates all of that. They have a block that it can insert any time in the day. It doesn't have to be at the end of the day or the start of the day. And they specify specific science criteria. They can say, look for targets that are far away from the rover, look at targets that are close, look at big targets, look at bright targets, look at textured targets, whatever. Uh, and then the, the software takes care of it all on its own. Uh, and there's a great article in Science Robotics on this uh, last year. And this has been so successful that they actually are taking more than 50% more ChemCam uh, measurements than they used to because it's much easier to take them, okay? And the next rover is going to Mars, Mars 2020, is going to have an even more capable targeting system on board. Oops. Oops, lost. Oh, whoops, it's over there already on the edge. So it's going to be able to do things, and in the future we want to do even more advanced things, like classify different surfaces, and the scientists are very interested in what's uh, imaging called contact layers, contact or boundary layers. So take a set of measurements across the different boundaries of you know the mudstone and different things like that. Now, I'm a planning and scheduling person, and I told you M2020 is the next rover. Uh, so the, what I'm most excited about is the next rover will have an AI scheduling system on board. Um, and why, why are we interested in an AI scheduling system on board? Other than, of course, since I'm an AI scheduling person, I think it's a lot of fun. So it turns out they did this study on MSL. And in MSL, they predict how long the activity is going to take, and they're conservative. And when they get done early, they can't really do anything else. And so the rover spends a fair amount of time sitting around, as much as 30% of the time sitting around. Um, and that's because if things run late, it doesn't have the ability to fix things and drop activities, okay? And if things run late, then they do what's called a fault out, and that's like a really bad deal. Nobody likes that. They have to figure out exactly what went wrong. So this is actually showing uh, basically how many hours of missed time, time and energy, because uh, the rover is sitting around. Actually, we have an RTG on the MSL rover. It's basically... It's People might tell you it's a nuclear reactor. It's not. That's an active nuclear reaction. This is radioactive decay producing electricity. Okay, so it's an RTG. Uh, and so if we have extra power, we actually get rid of it because too much power is a thermal problem. So we actually shunt it. So it's literally wasted. Okay. So what the scheduler does, this is a plan for a day. This is a specific one, medium dry with post drive images with post-drive imaging, and when this drive finishes early, it can, it's smart enough to adjust the rest of the plan here. Uh, we're going to see it very slowly. And that might seem like a little deal to you that it adjusted that plan, but there's a lot of work that goes into having the system able to do that. 
So we have to be able to fully represent all of the constraints that we have in the schedule. And this is actually the same, uh, the same portion of the plan here, but it's actually showing how it's scheduling it. So these are all the different constraint intervals that we're intersecting. And then we're also tracking the energy level. This uh, line here is the energy level across the SOL, the, 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 the Martian day. Uh, and it's very nonlinear how you manage the energy. And one of the most important things that we schedule on board is we actually schedule the wake and sleep cycles of the rover. You tend not to be awake during the whole day. You actually take naps in order to conserve energy. So you have more energy to do things because energy is one of the limiting factors. So as you can imagine, people are sort of stressed by the idea that an onboard allegedly smart AI system is gonna be scheduling when the rover is awake or asleep. Because let's say for example, if you go to sleep and don't schedule an awake, that's end of mission, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so you would not imagine how many hundreds of hours of meetings we've been in in talking about the eight to ten safeguards that we have to make sure that never happens. Okay. Yes. Sorry, quick question. So I spend a lot of time talking to people that are kind of consumers of the products of innovation. Mm -hmm. and they do modeling and so on. Thanos or neurology or other things. So I wonder if you get a lot of constraints or guidance or priorities from people that are analyzing the data as you go. It could be people or it could be systems in the rover, yep. right? So do you, do you have those types of constraints? Yes, so there's kind of two set, two origins of those constraints. There's the engineering constraints, which are, you know, you can't do this because you're going to break the rover and endanger it or the spacecraft, or the spacecraft just can't point that fast. Then there's the science constraints. And so uh, I was very fortunate to have gotten to work on the European Space Agency's Rosetta mission, uh, you know, which you might have heard of. It escorted this comet, Churyum on Grasimenko, for over a year. And I guess. I'm going to repeat a phrase that Steve Smith coined, where he said something like, you know, solving a scheduling problem is not being presented with a problem and producing a valid solution. It's the process of uncovering the underlying constraints that are really driving how you attack the problem. And that is absolutely the case. So in Rosetta, we would often get a set of constraints on a science campaign, then we would run our scheduler, and then the campaign would not appear. And then the scientist comes to yell at me, like literally, you know, I'm down in my office in Madrid and they're like, where the H did my like observations go? And so we had a constraint visualizer, which showed the intersection of all these constraints, kind of like this, but much more complicated because they're all these geometric constraints. And they would say, ah, oh, did I say the phase angle had to be 35 degrees? I really meant it could be 45 degrees because I can relax that, but that means I'm not gonna get any data, right? And the problem is there's this immense multi-objective optimization space. And I would venture to say that even the scientists can't even characterize the space. So one, one of the uh, uh, cases that I use to give my example is there's one mapping campaign by the OSIRIS instrument that we identified over 20 dimensions of that campaign that would be considered different parameters of that campaign that they would have to specify their objective function over those 20 dimensions. So it's like a series of blocks and how many blocks you get and how the blocks are spaced. Each block is 12 observations, how it's set, how those are separated. You know, it's a set of maps you're making. You want them to be the same distance from the nucleus because otherwise you have to correct for that. You want the same lighting, you know, all these different constraints. And it's like, which do you want most? No idea, right? So that's, I think, a you know, great area uh, of work, you know, and then, in fact, you know, when I was talking about the sensor web stuff, integrating the modeling with the sensing is something that we're also trying to do. It's a long journey. So in practice, how many, well, I guess, how many rounds do you end up going through? And like, as the missions proceed, did the scientists get better? And until time runs out. That would be the Rosetta experience. So, I, I mean, okay. at some point, you... Tweak until death. And actually, I would say it's mostly based on the personality of the scientists, how many rounds you go. I mean, there was one scientist we had actually, JPL, Matthew Tribriana, I love him, but like, he's like fiddling with the exact angles of every slew, like literally to the last minute. And he would probably agree with this. It's not clear that his tweaked slew parameters were better than the machine, the algorithm we had generated. He just liked to do that. 
<laughs> Did that? Yeah, well, I just, so I guess the, the kind of, just, my second question was like, do they get better at it? It sounds like. Yes, no, 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 they absolutely get better at it. In fact, on Rosetta, they got so much better at it that uh, after we saved the spacecraft, we had a, it was blinded by some of the dust, they actually went to a new operation scheme that was more flexible that one of the two planning systems that we deployed, they didn't use. So basically they learned so much about exploring the constraint space that they knew how to place the campaigns on their own. And so they just did that. It's just like AI the other way. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's not a bad thing. Yeah. Yeah. If I understand it correctly, you're saying that people were putting constraints on this uh, uh, optimization tool that were somewhat arbitrary. Um, I wouldn't say they're arbitrary. I would say that because of the because of the tool, they were forced to specify them as hard constraints, but really they were soft constraints. Yeah, that's what yeah. I was wondering. Is there a way to somehow make them soft constraints? Or sure, just... but then you run against the problem that I mentioned that when they're soft constraints, now you have to trade them off, and you have these thirty dimensions. And how do you trade them off? And if you ask them for what their objective function is over those thirty dimensions, they can't provide it. Yeah. And so. I mean, what there's people who spend their careers on this, you know, preference theory, right? How do you ask the fewest number of questions to like characterize the state? Yeah. Okay. So at, at the constraints of a restricted representational form to hit the right trade off between expressivity and the reasoning with them? Yes, I would say that typically when we deploy, we have to run in with what we have. <laughs> so I would say that they're often the representation from the last mission or the last n missions. And then oftentimes we learn that we would like to do more. And depending on the size of the project, we would have a chance to do some of that, uh, but not, I would say, enough from a research perspective. So like one of the things we learned on Rosetta is Rosetta is highly geometric. We have this nucleus, say the sun is over there, and we fly in these what are called pyramidal orbits. The joke was we fly like a skateboarder, we, we thrust and then we zoom by the nucleus, and then we thrust again and we zoom by the nucleus. And so very geometric in terms of the illumination conditions and the comet is rotating while we're doing this. Uh, and so we got a lot better at that. Is that problem solved? Absolutely not. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so this is actually, I probably should have jumped to this earlier. Yeah, I'm going to have to speed up here a little bit. This is an example of a one-month plan uh, on, uh, for uh, Rosetta. Uh, we schedule, you know, these roughly 2,000 observations. There are 60 active science campaigns on any what's called MPP, medium term plan. Uh, and they're subject to all these different constraints like cadence, geometry, if they're mapping constraints particularly. So all these resources. Uh, and all of those constraints have to be satisfied for it to be a valid plan. And really what we're doing is we're trying to help the people negotiate this across this, you know, 14 nation, whatever consortium, 15 instruments and so on. Uh, and and that's, that's the challenge. This particular science planning process is not fully automated, but, you know, also on board, we want to automate it. So now I'm going to hop into, I'm going to change gears quite rapidly and talk about three combinatorial optimization problems, which are examples of core AI problems. The first literally comes from Rosetta. So imagine we planned out all these activities and all these activities are producing data and we have to figure out where we're going to put the data and how we're going to get it down. So we basically get a set of data producers over a function of time and we're going to solve this problem in isolation from the scheduling problem. That's obviously wrong. They're obviously interlinked, but you have to start somewhere. Okay. So the activities generate this data, and the data, depending on the instrument, it's going to go to a specific buffer. Each of those buffers have capacities, and then we actually downlink that data. And the way we downlink that data is for, this is true for almost every spacecraft that's ever been flown. For each downlink pass, you have a priority table on the buffers. The way the flight software will work is it will take the data from the highest priority buffer, Suck that out until one of two things happens. That buffer is empty, or you issue what's called a stop dump camp, uh, command, which at that time basically asserts that buffer has the lowest priority for the remainder of that downlink. Okay? And usually, the constraint that you're trying to optimize is you're assuming that you can actually not overflow any buffer, um, but you want to minimize the peak volume for across all of the buffers. So you're trying to maximize some form of margin, okay? 
Uh, you also have these special cases, which are called deadlines. So specific observations have temporal deadlines that they have to be downlinked by. Okay, uh, an example of the size of this problem, Rosetta actually at the medium term planning level, which is roughly a month, this is a 450 variable decision problem. Uh, I said 450 variables, it's 15 times 30, 15 is the number of buffers, uh, there are 30 downlinks, roughly speaking, each one you're setting a priority for. And we actually looked at this only controlling the soft thumps or only controlling the priorities. Because you can actually look at the joint space, but that's just too large of a search space. Um, so this is literally, so how did we solve this? We solved with, with this with heuristic forward search. There are different heuristics like uh, postpone maximally the time you're going to overflow or some look ahead metric, maximize your margin, but then you get backed into these corners and then you actually have to have limited backtracking. We didn't actually have the computational resources to do exhaustive search. Uh, and so this is actually showing like the downlinks. This must be a, a, a NASA ground station at 70 meters. So it's downlinking much more rapidly. We're tracking the flow of all, through all these buffers. And one of the things that's complicated is it's been shown that you can solve this optimally with an LP if you have no overlap between your producers and your uh, reducers. Okay, so that means you're not producing data during your downlink. So in fact, the Mars Express downlink problem was solved by Amino Chesta and also another PhD student at the University of Turin. He's the one who came up with the optimal LP solution. But for many of these problems, you actually do have overlap between these. So for Rosetta, some of our downlinks are 12 hours long. Some of our observation campaigns are continuous. So obviously we have overlaps between them and they matter. Okay, so this is a great example of a combinatorial or a search optimization problem. The second one is area coverage scheduling. So this is actually the science plan for an, uh, a mission called NISAR. It's a collaboration between ISRO, the Indian Space Agency, and NASA slash JPL. And all of these different colors are different science campaigns. And all of them have different constraints on them. So different constraints might be the revisit rate, you know, how often you have to see them. Uh, some of them might be growing campaigns, so you need to visit them once in the spring and once in the fall, where there's some time range there. And then the instrument mode where you observe it, if you're you know, looking at ice or you're looking at um, vegetation, you're in a different instrument mode, which might mean your swath is different, your data volume is different. The goal is to cover all of these campaigns with priority uh, uh, while respecting all of your, you know, your spacecraft constraints. And so you have what are called mapping observations, which is like a region, which is most of what I saw there. Then we have targeted observations, which is hit this one point, that's probably a calibration site, very high priority. And you have limited onboard storage, instrument visibility, instrument timing, and then your uplinks and downlinks. And so how do we solve this? This is actually work coming out of Russ Knight, who's in my group. This is from his PhD about 10 years ago with Rich Corp. Uh, and so you actually model the surface as a set of these grid points. There's literally, you know, you model the Earth's surface with hundreds of thousands of grid points, maybe to one kilometer or five kilometer spacing. And then you compute the set of all possible observations. So each time tick, it might be one second, it might be 10 minutes or something. You say, if I'm in this observation mode, what areas will I hit? And you resolve that to a bitwise problem of all these grid points instead of doing the exact geometric computation. You can do the exact geometric computation, but it's very slow. <laughs> um, and we're taking into, also taking advantage of the fact that roughly speaking, the Earth is an oblate sphere. Uh, we have tried to extend these techniques to irregular bodies like comets, and nucleus, and stuff like that. And let's just say it's hard. So you formulate this problem by computing the set of all possible observations. You have these regions of interest and you basically compute the intersections of these observation, possible observations with that, okay? And so now there's two things you wanna do. One is you want to um, optimize your scoring function over that and you're doing subset selection of the set of observation records and you're subject to this constraint function. And the constraint function is basically telling you if the subset of observations that you've taken is feasible. So like, you know, you'd ask, can you slew in between uh, or different things like that. And so we have used this literally, uh, you know, for probably almost 100 mission studies now, and, you know, maybe five or 10 missions. And the two techniques we've used are some forms of domain specific search. The one general technique that we have used is squeaky wheel optimization. So you have some greedy algorithm for covering, it's operating in priority first order. By the way, this is the same technique we use for the Rosetta problem. 
uh, the Rosetta activity scheduling problem, not the downloading problem. Uh, you have a greedy algorithm, and then you basically promote the priorities of things that didn't get in with the greedy algorithm, and you keep iterating. Okay. So what are examples of that? EcoStress is a mission that launched last July. It's doing thermal mapping of the Earth uh, with an emphasis on the United States because it's funded by the United States. Uh, and so this is actually showing us, you know, doing the mapping coverage campaigns for EcoStress. And we had to solve this problem not once, but three times because basically there have been two different anomalies on the spacecraft that basically made it a different spacecraft. Actually, a different instrument this is on the space station. Uh, OCO3, uh, which is measuring carbon uh, in the atmosphere, again, it's an instrument that's going to be on the space station. It has different modes, what's called area mapping mode, lint mode when it's over the ocean, and then nadir mode when it's over the land. Uh, we do that as well. Uh, that's going to launch in uh, about two and a half weeks. So, uh, as you can imagine, we're in quite a tizzy over that. Okay, so now the third combinatorial optimization problem I'm going to mention is actually much, much harder. And it's what's called the agile framing coverage problem. So, imagine a spacecraft flying over a target. And now, instead of taking a single picture, we want to take a mosaic of 20, 30, 40 pictures in order to cover some area that we want. Why is this hard? Oh, you just take these tiles and you lay them down. The problem is, depending on when you take the tile, your footprint is different. Why is that? If I'm looking to the side, the footprint is extended. It's, it's basically grown in the cross-track dimension while it's further away, right? Because you look further away, the same angular field of view goes differently. So this is an example from a single overflight. This here uh, is the footprint uh, of this centered on this point P if I take it at the start, and this dark line is the final footprint if I take that image four minutes later. Okay, so the footprints are changing. And the second problem is the distances between the adjacent tiles is actually changing. You're like, wait, no. Well, sort of it's changing because the footprint size is changing and you want to overlay the tiles, but it's also changing because when I go between two different points, 100 kilometers apart, and I'm, it's very far near the horizon, it's a very small angular distance. It's a slew. But if I do that in Nader, it's a, it's a larger angular distance. So not only are the footprints changing, the distance, the time it takes the spacecraft to point to cover between those two adjacent points is changing. So you can think of it as a TSP with varying weights, and then, by the way, your targets are varying as well. So we have a whole family of different techniques. Uh, this one is a traditional milling technique, which is done from analogy to actually cutting, you know, cutting from sculpting or something like that. Uh, this is the a, a sidewinder technique, which is basically also called, you know, lawnmower or most of hedron. Grid nibbler is actually starting at the middle and trying to go out. Uh, there's another method that somehow I'm missing here. Uh, where we do radial cycles, and all of them are trying to uh, make the irregular problem more regular. So one of the biggest problems is having a coverage estimation, which is taking account for how your footprint is growing and shrinking, and a distance estimation between the adjacent tiles. And so if you can organize your search in a way that you can actually estimate that, and we've also tried applying machine learning techniques to try and learn estimator functions, if you have a good estimator function, you can actually plan all this. Okay. And this is actually showing uh, how these different techniques perform differently depending on the agility of the spacecraft. Okay. So if your spacecraft can point very quickly, then your goal is to do things like minimize the make span. Uh, if your spacecraft is not very agile, you're just struggling to even cover the problems <coughs> and to be able to solve them with the different techniques. So that's the third. Uh, and why do we want to do this? We want to do this so fast that we can do this on board the spacecraft because we want a spacecraft, a lead spacecraft, to find something. And then we want the following spacecraft to be able to respond to that. You know, if we see a volcanic plume with the lead spacecraft and the following spacecraft, images that, that exactly that plume. Um, OCO, OCO3, we actually want to do that, for example, to target around clouds. And then we also want to do this in the deep space context. So, so I mentioned that I worked on Rosetta. One of the really frustrating things is we're planning these observations weeks in advance. So if I look at this particular uh, nucleus, you know, maybe two weeks in advance, and I have this narrow field of view instrument that tells me about gas production, 
I just have to sweep it all the way across the nucleus and hope that I get the, the plumes that I want. So for a future mission, we'd like to take these image processing techniques that were developed by David Brown and my group. We just recently published this in the Astronomical Journal. We'd like to track the plumes and then be able to do a stylized, on-the-fly tracing of the plumes with this narrow field of view instrument. So that would allow unique measurements that we did not get at Rosetta. We'd be able to track the composition and gas production as a function of where we are in the rotation. So now, I'm just going to end with a little bit on why I'm still at NASA. I'm still at NASA because AI is essential to what I think the essential role of NASA is, which is to look at some big problems that you know Google is not going to do, Amazon is not going to do, which is to find life outside the Earth. So everybody who's interested in astrobiology now within the solar system is focused on Europa. Why are we focused on Europa? Well, Europa actually has more water than the Earth, and it's trapped underneath an icy shell. And uh, when I was a kid growing up, people said, you can't have life without photosynthesis, right? The beautiful thing about science is we can be wrong and the scientific method will correct us. So then in the 70s, they discovered these black smokers on the bottom of the ocean, then they discovered the white smokers. These are ecosystems that survive in the absence of life in photosynthesis. They survive off of what are called chemoclines, specific chemical interactions between magma and water, and that produces the nutrients to sustain life. In fact, there's a growing theory that that's how life on the Earth started. This is in competition with the traditional theory, which is you have water on the surface, you have these precursors to amino acids, lightning comes in and injects energy, you know, just like the Frankenstein, and then you have life. So there is reason to believe that not only does Europa potentially have these hydrothermal vents, Enceladus may have them as well. And Cassini measurements of Enceladus, which is one of the moons of Saturn, show even that the, co the components that are in that those plumes in Enceladus are actually the right components to, to create to, to sustain life. But it's hard to do a mission like this. And you know, space missions are hard. This is particularly hard. So first we have to fly to Jupiter, which is going to take a long time. Then we have to land. We have to get into orbit around Jupiter, and we have to get an orbit around Europa, and we have to land on this icy crust. Then we have to melt through this icy crust. People think this crust is tens of kilometers thick. It is going to take years to melt through this crust. There are people working on melting techniques. By the way, when they melt through, they have to dodge voids in big boulders, where they get what happened, you know, what ha what's happened to the inside lander, where it can't warm down further. And then we have to explore this with some kind of submersible. And I joke that we don't know what the submersible will look like. It actually probably be buoyancy controlled, so it won't look like that but it has to have a NASA logo, of course. <laughs> uh, and so we want to go and hunt for hydrothermal vents, right? Because that's the source of light. That has to be done by AI. It has to be done by AI because we can only communicate back when we're at the base station. And we want to go out and look for this light and to come back. And we have teams that are already developing these kinds of algorithms. This is from a deployment that we had uh, about a year and a half ago off the Monterey Coast. This is a collaboration between us, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, and Bari, Woodsville Oceanographic Institute, UI, uh, Caltech, uh, and Remote Sensing Solutions. This, in this particular demonstration, we were showing how coordinated vehicles could map out and hunt for particular plumes. And if you think that you know Europa submersible is a, a science fiction, well, it sort of is, but it sort of not is. <coughs> We were very lucky. We got to piggyback on a cruise led by Andre Botius of the Alfred Wegener Institute. Uh, and the hydrothermal vent uh, part was led by Chris German, the world famous hydrothermal vent hunter for Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. And we studied how they used this vehicle called NUID, NUID Under Ice, and how they mapped out and searched for the hydrothermal vents at the Karasik Massif. And we took those best algorithms and we implemented them as these nested search algorithms and we're hoping next year to go out and test these again. Unfortunately, probably not in the Arctic, probably uh, in the Indian Ocean uh, or uh, in the Aegean. And then finally, I just want to leave you with what's the ultimate test for AI in space? Well, we talked about how hard it is to get to the sub-ice ocean of Europa. It's even harder to get to another star. 
So the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, is about four and a half light years away. With the currently available technology, it would cost a lot of money to get there, but not only would it cost a lot of money, depending on who you ask, it would take 60 to 100 years to get there. So the spacecraft is pretty much on its own. Let's imagine that the propulsion people do their job and they solve that problem. Now, when you're there, the spacecraft is really on its own. If I sent it a signal, it would take four and a half years to get it and four and a half years for it to reply. So it has to decide how to get into orbit, what measurements to take, what data to send back. And if I want to go to the TRAPPIST system, which is even more interesting, it's 10 plus light years away, take all those things and multiply them by two or three. So right now on Rosetta, over 2,000 people work on the Rosetta mission. We have to somehow find a way to take all of that brain power and build an AI system that can conduct such a mission on its own. So to me, that's the ultimate challenge for AI, at least in the space context. I'm just going to finish up by saying that I talked a lot about different you know, ways in which AI is being used in NASA. Unfortunately, so I talked about the good side. AI is being used in NASA in a lot of different ways. The bad side is that it's only a fraction of the number of places that it should be used. Also, since I'm a planning and scheduling person, I didn't talk at all about machine learning. Machine learning is being used all over the place at AI, uh, sorry, at JPL and NASA. Uh, most prominently, there's large sky surveys. There's a radio science sky survey called Be Faster, where it's being used to automatically detect radio science anomalies. Um, there's a one uh, it's being used in the visual domain. There's a system called IPTF, which tracks all these visual anomalies, which can be supernovas or meteorites or whatever, uh, out of the Palomar Sky Survey. Um, it's now becoming not even news when uh, they discover new exoplanets using machine learning. It's happened now several times uh, in the Kepler data set, and now the test data set is being explored using machine learning techniques. And you know we have many more papers on this. Uh, you can always email me or go to our website at ai.jpl.nasa.gov. And of course, I'll leave you with the JPL mantra, which is their mighty things. Thank you very much for your time. We might have time for at least a couple of questions. So. They always try and drag me down in the afternoon. Or fire me an email. Even random space questions. I always get <laughs> random space questions. Here's a, here's a fun random space question. How many of you guys have seen The Martian? Most of you probably, I hope. Oh no, so disappointing. Um, what's wrong with that movie? <clears throat> At the base premise. Wind. Exactly, yeah. So the Martian atmosphere is a few percentage points of the Earth's atmosphere. So the notion that there could be a windstorm that could cause damage to assets on Mars, even with the case that so the, most of the things that we send out in space are extremely flimsy, right? So basically, the force is proportional to the density. So if you have a 100 mile an hour wind at Mars, it's like a two mile an hour breeze. It's not going to. And actually, the author knew that. But, you know, so the JPL, we endlessly get bombarded by people from the Hollywood community, you know, asking people to like, you know, open or whatever. The joke is that uh, when Technical accuracy meets plot line. It's clear who wins. <laughs> My brother-in-law is actually in the movie industry, so we like hear this endlessly. You can hope that not a movie. Sure, you can say whatever you want, but most likely it's going to be ignored if it conflicts with their plot line. Even movies like you know Interstellar, right, which is Kip Thorne's baby. There's definitely some technical mistakes there, or stretches, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is not about JPL so much, but Mars. Uh, asked earlier why uh, reddish skill set iron actually is iron oxide. Yes. Yeah. Right? yeah. So or rust. Yeah. Word. So was there lots of oxygen there before that all got uh, eaten up by uh, combining? I don't think iron? it takes that much oxygen. I'm not. I'm not an expert on that, but I mean. The theories are that Mars at one point in time did have an atmosphere not unlike the Earth, right? Um, but there are several 
reasons why the atmosphere was not sustained. So first of all, the gravity at Mars is much less. Second of all, I'm not qualified to answer why, but uh, Mars does not have the same strength of magnetic field that the Earth does. And the magnetic field is actually very important to protect us from ionizing radiation. Um, and I think that has something to do with the lack of an atmosphere there as well. Yeah, so it's very, very hard to go and live in Mars. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean people are proposing it as a solution to our problems. On yes, so, <laughs> yeah, so particularly when I'm like in, let, let's say, less technical forums, you know, we always get asked this you know, question or people make the point, we have to go to Mars because, you know, when we mess up this planet, um, you know, we need some place to go. And my response is always the same. Earth is much closer to being habitable than Mars. So it's much less effort to fix whatever is messed up on Earth than to actually go and live on Mars. I mean, by like not even any stretch of the imagination, right? Um, you know, just to go and send, you know, you know, to land a 1,000 kilogram rover on Mars, you know, billions of dollars, right? Think of the supply chain that it takes to actually sustain people there, right? And so, I mean, really, you have to live off the land, right? And then we have to figure out how to do that. That's, that's the challenge, right? Behind all colonies. But there are lots of, you know, other wacky ideas, you know, running around NASA. Actually, I shouldn't say wacky. I would say far out ideas. So and one example is, you know, why you should care about AI in space? Well, your life may depend on it. So we really don't know what the near Earth object population is. You know, these are all the things that are in orbits near the Earth. If the wrong one of us, one of them hits the Earth, we're just gone. Nothing you can do about it. Well, at least there's nothing we can do now. Uh, so NEO 100 is a mission concept where you would fly 100 of the same mission, take a very cheap spacecraft, and you build enough AI in it so it goes out, scouts one of these near-Earth objects, and comes back and tells you all about it. Why do you have to have AI? No one's going to operate 100 of these spacecraft. And by the way, you can't even communicate with them easily because they're, they're very small. They would probably be like a 6 or 12 u spacecraft, about this big. Uh, and they want to statistically assay the near-Earth objects. We want to know, are they like asteroids, very dense? Uh, that's actually not good news for human survivability. Or are they very non-dense and porous, more like a comet? Um, by the way, if they're asteroids, then there's other people who are interested in mining them. Why are they interested in mining the, NE the NEOs and not the asteroids? And we know have all these valuable heavy metals because they're close. So close doesn't mean physical proximity close. Close means delta V close. It means that they're in a velocity vector which is very comparable to Earth. So uh, there are concepts to do what's called robotic colonization of the near-Earth objects, which again would require all kinds of smarts and AI. What does that mean? You go there and land on one of these objects and you try and use it as a little mini spacecraft. What does that mean? Oh, well, you mine the minerals from it and you use it to spray in construction. Or you produce fuel there. Uh, or you shape the asteroids to make a coarse reflector and then you synthesize an aperture from hundreds of these to do radio science and stuff like that. So this is literally robotic colonization <laughs> of not a planet, but a habitat. There are a lot of ideas like that flying around. Like one of the most exciting ones now is uh, you guys might have heard of this interstellar object that came through, which I can't pronounce to Manu or whatever. When they choose these foreign languages, right, to name them. So I was actually sitting in a meeting where a guy comes running in because the head of navigation at JPL was in this meeting. Like they're like running in and they're like, oh my God. And he like runs out and they're like trying to figure out how to get a solution on this object and point telescopes to go and see it. There are people who are proposing a mission, which would be a standby mission where you have four or five of these spacecraft that would be launched and in an orbit where you could cover the space and you could get more data on an object like this. Uh, and all of the terminal guidance and imaging and everything has to be uh, autonomous because the object's relative velocity is so fast, you just have to take that long. And then there's even a crazy idea by Masahiro Ono, which is called the hitchhiker, comet hitchhiker, where you take a long period comet and you harpoon it 
uh, and you catch a ride on it in order to get more data. And then you can get out to the Oort cloud, one quarter of the way to the nearest one. Many, many challenges on that. Carbon, nano, diamond, like that, because speed and velocity are so big. I saw one comment. If not, then let's thank the speaker once again. Thank you.